is a real privilege for me able to be able to do this because if you talk to my kids or my friends or my coworkers, they'll tell you that uh, I can really go off on a tangent talking about uh, Arizona history and family history. So it was a real uh, thrill to be able to do this, but it was last minute. I, my, my cousin, Kathy, was going to do this, and my aunt uh, had to have surgery this morning, so I stepped in to cover for her. So I had to kind of throw it together, but um, I can pretty much do it off the top of my head, except for the dates. Um, I am part of the Gibson family, um, and I admit I'm an imposter. I did not graduate from Chandler High School. <laughs> I didn't grow up in Chandler, but was born uh, when my parents were living in Chandler. Uh, couldn't be born in Chandler because they didn't have a hospital then, so I was born in Mesa General. Uh, but I've always had really, really strong roots to Chandler and to the people that live here, primarily through my grandparents. Um, so to uh, start off on my family history, the Gibsons weren't really the first property owners in Chandler. Uh, my grandfather was the first one in my family here, but he was working here. The first property owners were actually the Blakes, um, my, my grandmother's family. And uh, Edward and uh, Edward Blake and Mary Otis Blake um, first came to Chandler in, um, well, actually, Edward Blake came to Chandler in 1922. But they were true Arizona pioneers. Um, they couldn't qualify as native Arizonans because she was three when she came to Prescott and he was seven. He came from Idaho, she came from upstate New York in the uh, 1870s. Uh, by covered wagon because the railroad didn't go into uh, Prescott. My great-great-grandfather, T.W. Otis, had the general store in Prescott and formed, uh, founded the Congregational Church and was postmaster general. Um, and prior to the Civil War, he went to college in Oberlin, Ohio, which is just outside of Cleveland. And the Civil War broke out. He got drafted into the Ohio Reserves. And after he got out, he brought his family out west, he spent a year or two in, um, in Los Angeles, kind of thought that was going nowhere, moved to Prescott, uh, where he started his business. So my great-grandparents kind of grew up as childhood friends and were childhood sweethearts. My, my great-grandfather sent, uh, my great-great-grandfather sent my uh, great-grandmother, uh, Mary Otis, back to um, Oberlin to go to college. My great-grandfather followed her. But he only lasted two years. Probably money was rented then, and he had to return to Prescott. She did graduate from uh, Oberlin. And when they returned, uh, they, uh, they married. They had uh, five children, and my grandmother, Margaret uh, Gibson, was um, the second oldest. And uh, she was born in uh, 1898. They lived in southern Arizona for a little while in Naco, which was on the border. And he managed a bank for the Bank of Douglas. But in 1910, a uh, little revolution broke out on the border. And things were really unsettled. And so they had to leave. They went back over to uh, LA area. Uh, to, uh, they had a farm in Santa Ana. But my great grandmother was not a farmer. He was strictly business banker. And uh, so he came back to Arizona and left them over in uh, California. Um, when he came back, he went to work for uh, Kila Valley Bank and Trust, which was the predecessor of uh, Valley National Bank. Um, he was working for them when in 1922, they wanted to merge two local banks in Chandler. So that's what brought him to Chandler. Um, he purchased 80 acres of land on the corner, on the uh, northwest corner of Alma School and Chandler Boulevard. And that was what was later known as the Gibson property. Uh, but he, he purchased it. My grandfather bought it from him later. Um, now, my grandfather was born in Fredericksburg, Texas, and grew up in uh, Fredericksburg. But he had family that had already come out to Arizona. He had two uncles that had ranches in Globe that came out in the 1880s, drove cattle out to Texas, and he had an uncle in Mesa, um, Albert Gibson, that had a cotton farm. And Albert Gibson had seven daughters, 
that were known as the Gibson girls. <laughs> and that's going to tie in later when I talk about the uh, sheep trek. Uh, but his uncle Albert is what brought him to Mesa. His first job was here in Chandler, working at the Arrow Pharmacy, right across the street on the corner of the plaza. But he just worked there for a couple of years. Um, and then after that, he went to work for White Cross Drugs, which was located on the west side of the plaza, uh, just down from where the Santan Brewery is right now. Um, my, my grandfather had, um, had served in the Marine Corps, and was, uh, but he never saw action. He, he stayed at Paris Island. And, um, when he was discharged, he went back to Texas and he got his uh, pharmacy degree in uh, Galveston. Back then, I think it was like a year or two to get a pharmacy degree. Much, much different than it is now. The scary thing is, is I remember as a kid, he kept his license current up until almost the year he died. And I thought, man, that's a scary thought. <laughs> <laughs> because pharmacy has changed so much. Um, my grandfather was a real character. Um, a uh, total practical joker, uh, very social, had lots and lots of friends. And I, I've got a bunch of pictures that I'm going to show you uh, after I'm through. Uh, and, and there's somewhere you can really get that idea. Um, and my grandfather's name was Irving Gibson, but nobody called him that. Well, except my great aunt uh, would call him that, especially if she was mad at him. But everybody called him Gibby. Uh, he, he was always known by Gibby. Um, my grandmother, uh, Margaret Gibson, uh, previously Margaret Blake, um, she went to school in Pomona and graduated in, um, I think, 1920. And uh, then she went for one year to uh, the Sorbonne in Paris, where she studied. She came back, and in 1923, she came to Chandler because her parents had moved to Chandler, and she was hired as the language instructor at Chandler High School, all languages. She taught um, French, Spanish, and Latin. Until 1927, uh, when my dad was born, uh, and, then, and then she uh, quit that job and just substituted. Um, my grandparents, uh, married in February of 1924, and they married at the Trinity Cathedral in Phoenix at First Avenue in Roosevelt because there was no Episcopal Church in Chandler at the time, and my great-grandfather was an Episcopalian and he wanted, wanted it to be in that church. Uh, so they weren't actually married in Chandler. Um, in 1927, uh, my dad was born, and also in 1927, my grandfather along with his uh, business partner pretty much for life after that, Gail Johnson, um, bought White Cross drugs from the owners, uh, Gardner and Foreman. And um, along with that, my grandfather bought Gardner's house, which was located at 254 North Washington Street in Chandler. Um, in 1930, my, my grandparents and my dad moved out to the farm at Elm School and Chandler Boulevard. Um, previous to that, the, the uh, farm had been leased out to other farmers in the area because, uh, as I said before, my great-grandfather was absolutely not a farmer, didn't have a clue, so he leased it out to other farmers. So um, my, my grandfather started to farm there when, when he moved out in uh, 1930. Um, now, during the time that he owned the um, White Cross drugstore, my grandfather <coughs> was um, a big time golfer at the San Marcos, was, was pretty much a semi-pro golfer. And he uh, golfed with Greg Madison, Bill Coggins, and uh, Frank Beer. Um, and uh, I couldn't find the pictures, but I had seen pictures previously where he's wearing the knickers and the cap. And, and, it has the wooden shaft golf clubs and uh, you know golfing out on the San Marcos and I believe at that time they had oil sand uh, greens yeah um, 
Funny thing is, when he sold the drugstore and started working in ranching, he never golfed again. Uh, well, I, actually, I remember when I was a kid, him talking to Milt Coggins about getting together and golfing or something like that. I don't know whether he ever actually did. But he, he never really kept it up after that. Um, I think he, he golfed primarily as his way to get outside and have exercise and stuff when he was working in the drugstore. Um, now, also, at the time that he owned White Cross Drug Store, he, he was a, a huge practical joker. So um, I called my dad and I asked, you know, tell me some of the practical jokes that he used to play. And one that my dad recalled was um, one of his friends, uh, uh, Doc Purnell, who was a dentist, um, they got together and cast a hand out of plaster and then painted it to look very realistic and then put some blood on it and put it in a box. And then all the customers that came in the next day just said, oh yeah, there was a really bad accident last night. And, hey, we just found this out on the road. And they'd open it up and stare away. <laughs> oh, yeah. that, that was typical of the kinds of things that, that he would do. I mean, and it made no difference how old you were. You could be a little kid. You could be in your 80s. You were, everybody was fair game. You guys are not your head. No, yeah. yeah. Um, he, he was constantly playing practical jokes. Some of his other fr uh, close friends were uh, uh, Dr. Uh, James Meeson and uh, Dr. Poli, who were also um, some good friends of his. Um, my uncle Richard was born in 1932. Um, and then in 1934, my grandfather sold White Cross Drug Store, and that was, that was the end of his um, pharmacy days in Chandler. And in 1935, he bought 90 acres uh, up near Heber, uh, Black Canyon Ranch, which is still in our family today, and as a matter of fact, that's where that is. Um, and um, there was an old uh, wood frame house there built out of ponderosa pine off the property. And that's pretty much the house that my, uh, my dad and my uncle grew up in for summers. Their time in Heber was always during the winter, during the school year. And then in the spring, they would load up and drive up through Salt River Canyon and spend the summers at Black Canyon Ranch. And my dad remembers being horribly embarrassed because they had an old pickup truck and a trailer with a milk cow and chickens. And he said they were like the jokes and the grapes of rat. <laughs> it was just really embarrassing driving up there. And they had to drive up the road to Salt River Canyon because feline didn't even exist at that time. Um, and uh, they would spend their summers up there and then they would come down to uh, back to Chandler for school. Um, and they had permission to um, start school late and finish school early. Um, because of this and because of my grandmother having been a teacher in, in uh, Chandler. Um, in 1935, my grandfather got involved in, with sheep, with the sheep business. And originally, they would take the sheep up and would pasture them in the summer at the Black Canyon Ranch. Um, and they did that for a few years. But as he got bigger, uh, 90 acres was not enough to pasture the amount of sheep that he had. And uh, was it? 41, 42, he started the sheep truck. Oh, oh and when uh, Francis Lyon did that. Well, I know when, when he did it, but um, anyway, uh, around the beginning of World War II, um, he started doing um, a sheep trek to um, um, up to the White Mountains. and. He, along with a lot of other ranchers in uh, Chandler, um, would uh, lease land from the White Mountain Apaches, and they would drive the sheep on foot all the way from uh, Chandler to um, the White Mountains on foot. And that was called the Heber Reno Trail. <coughs> well, you remember I mentioned um, my great great uncle Albert Gibson and the Gibson girls. One of his daughters, um, Helen, was married to Francis Lyne. Francis was um, a lecturer, and, uh, and he made movies and, um, for travel logs and lectured. And he hooked up with my grandfather, and um, I think it was 1942. He 
made an arrangement to trail with the sheep on foot all the way up to the White Mountains and film it. And he made a travel log and then lectured. And it was called uh, Sheep, Stars, and Solitude. And um, I would never seen him when I was a kid in grade school. And I have a, an old video, VHS video of it, but I looked at it and it's such bad quality that I, I did not bring that in. What I did bring in is some uh, copies from National Geographic because after he did that, he came back in, I think, 1948, and he did it again. And he wanted to follow the same sheep herd, um, Rosalio, Rosalio, Rosalio um, Lucero, who was from New Mexico, was a sheep herder, and that's the guy that worked for my grandfather, and he went with the first time. So the second time, he wanted to go with uh, Rosalio again. So, um, but the thing with the sheep herders in, in Chandler is the, uh, the sheep ranchers would go down to the bar in Chandler and would pretty much Shanghai them. You could get them drunk, throw them in the back of the pickup, drive them out to sheep camp, and they'd get up and drive the sheep. And that year, Gunner Two beat him to it. And so he had Rosalio. So, so uh, Francis Lyon ended up going along with Gunner Two's sheep uh, instead of my grandfather's. Um, and that's what he used for the article that uh, I'm going to show some pictures of from uh, National Geographic. He also wrote, ended up writing the book on that. He, he made a bundle of it, and it was really, really well known. But there were a lot of um, sheep ranchers in the Chandler area. Uh, besides Gunner Thu, there were the Dobsons, of course, and they were the last ones to stop doing this track um, not that long ago. I, and they didn't do it with all their sheep, just with a small amount, just to, just to keep the tradition alive. Um, there was uh, Bill Ryan and uh, Dawson Henderson. These were all sheep ranchers in Chandler, and they all did the same trek back and forth to the uh, White Mountains. Um, okay. Um, now, in the late 40s, my grandfather started to move into cattle. And he started off uh, with some Mexican steers, then he bought some steers out of Globe. And uh, by, by the late 40s, he was into full cattle ranching where he, where he had cows and uh, breeding bulls and, and the whole nine yards. And he started a feedlot um, at our property out at uh, Alma School and um, Chandler Boulevard. And one of the pictures I'm gonna show you is of a, um, a feed mixer that he made uh, it's a mechanical thing, that, and there was an article in the channel in the newspaper about it. Um, my mom and dad uh, uh, met and married in um, 1950, and um, in 1951, they moved out to the farm and feedlot in Chandler because my grandfather purchased uh, another piece of property outside of Heber called the Halter Cross. Which, and that's the property that most people remember and visited and, and everything else. Um, so he moved up there to live full time. My mom and dad only lived here uh, until 55? Yeah, 1955. Um, I was born in 1952. And um, in 1955, my grandfather sold the property uh, in a deal for some uh, ranch property outside of Snowflake, Arizona, and that was it, and that was, that was the end of our property in Arizona. But my grandfather always kept really strong roots with Chandler, because as a kid, I remember all of these people coming up from Chandler to stay with him or to visit, and that actually started way back when they were living out at the Black Canyon place, which you'll see in the pictures was a pretty funky place. Uh, the Halter Cross was, was really nice, beautiful adobe, uh, and oh, I should have brought a picture of that. Uh, it was, that was a beautiful place, and, and much more roomy, and uh, my grandfather on my mom's side and my uncle actually put electricity in there after he bought it, and it, it, it was very uh, hospitable, but uh, the Black Canyon place, not so much. But he always still had lots of guests coming up from Chandler to stay with him. Um, one of the things that my dad remembers uh, about Chandler um, that I always found really interesting is all of the farmers in Chandler, anybody pretty much outside the city, <coughs> had um, 25 hertz 
electricity. 25 cycles. That's 25 hertz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. They, back then, they called it 25 cycle. Yeah. Um, but um, 25 hertz. Uh, now we, we all have 60 hertz in, all over the country. And, and that actually switched over back around 1910, 1912. And that's how the farmers here ended up with 25 hertz. They were selling the old generators from Niagara Falls uh, in 1910 or 12. And they sold them to SRP, who installed them at Roosevelt Dam. And that's what supplied electricity to all the farmers in, in Chandler. Really, really frustrating uh, because a lot of your appliances wouldn't run on that. Uh, like my dad said, uh, he always wanted an electric train. Couldn't run it on that. Uh, lots of things wouldn't work on it. But that's what all the farmers were, were stuck with until, uh, let's see, 1950 or 49 or 49. 1949, they finally brought 60 hertz electric out to the farms and ranches in Chandler. Um, some of the families from Chandler that would come up and, and stay and visit up at the uh, Palter Cross and previous to that at the Black Canyon were John and Florence Eddy, uh, Joe and Pat Ryan, um, Evie Burgett, um, Applebee's, Guptels, uh, Dr. Neeson, Dr. Purnell. Um, there was a real, real strong uh, connection to Chandler. The women in my family also had a really strong connection to Chandler. Um, my uh, great-grandmother, in 1952, same year I was born, was elected Arizona Mother of the Year and was nominated by the Chandler Women's Club. And she was one of the founders of the Chandler Women's Club. My grandmother was also very active, and she was honored by the Chandler Women's Club in 1950. And I've got the booklet from that that I, that I brought along. Um, Now, I remember um, after we moved back down to Phoenix, uh, my, to the home that my parents are in now, still, near 11th Avenue in Glendale, um, trekking out here to visit my great-grandmother, um, uh, Mary Otis Blake. And she, at that time, was staying uh, in a private home that uh, took care of the elderly, run by uh, Mrs. Frederick. And it was right across from the um, Chandler High School on Arizona Avenue. And I remember coming out to visit her. And the odd thing is, years later, when I went to work in juvenile probation, uh, I ended up working with Miss Frederick's uh, granddaughter. Um, and I'll get to that later. I had a huge connection with the Chandler people uh, later in, in life. Um, My, my um, great-grandfather Blake uh, passed away in 1953, and my great-grandmother Mary Otis Blake passed away in 1958. Um, I'm one of the few people I know my age that has pictures sitting next to two of my great-grandmothers. Um, especially nowadays, don't see that very often. Um, Another thing that a lot of people don't know is that Alma School Road for a few years was named Gibson Road. Uh, there was a guy named Leland Entrican who was the John Deere dealer uh, who had his dealership at the corner of Baseline and Arizona Avenue. And he named all of the roads after the, his customers. Uh, and most of them, except ours, kept the name. Um, <laughs> apparently the, the uh, LDS Church you know, felt very strongly that Elm School Road should be named Elm School all the way through to Chandler because the Elm School was still on that road. Uh, so uh, from 1945 to 1951, Elm School Road was Gibson Road. And my dad said he remembers one of his friends coming up to him and saying, hey, you, uh, did Gibby not pay his taxes or something? Uh, they, they changed the name of your road. Um, and a lot of people I tell that say, yeah, sure. They a little bit. Um, but if you look around at all the other uh, roads that you've got now, you've got Dobson, Price, Ray, Ellsworth, Riggs, Knox, all ranchers and farmers around the Chandler area. Um, and what gets me is <coughs> all the roads changed from one rancher or farmer to another at baseline all the way out, 
even in Gilbert and, and Mesa. Um, but ours is the only one out of all of them that got changed. Um, okay, uh, my grandmother uh, passed away in uh, uh, 1965, and my grandfather um, passed away in 1977. And my uncle Richard continued to run the ranch, which was uh, called White Mountain Livestock, um, up until the 80s, and he sold it. And my cousin Larry Gibson continues to run the same ranch for the new owner that, that bought the ranch. So uh, my family is still up, up there running the same ranch. Um, now, what's really funny is <clears throat> Chandler is a pretty small town. Uh, I graduated, I did not graduate from Chandler High School. I graduated from Washington High School in Phoenix. And I went to ASU and uh, graduated in sociology. And in 1975, I went to work for Maricopa County Juvenile Probation Department. And when I first went to work there, uh, in the first year, I remember going to court. And the, uh, the kid that I was taking to court was the little brother of a girl I'd gone to high school with, uh, Kathy Addy, whose dad, Robert Addy, grew up in Chandler and had gone to high school with my dad. <coughs> and that's who was going to court. The court clerk was Velma Beach, and her her dad had a library in downtown Chandler. And the bailiff was um, Sally Sport, who was originally Sally Arambula, the little sister of my Uncle Richard's uh, best friend in high school. All this in one court hearing. The only person that wasn't there was the judge. And he was just scratching his head. He, was, uh, he thought it was really strange. Uh, but then I started to meet a lot of other people from Chandler. Um, uh, I, I worked with uh, a guy in detention, that uh, Brian West, who had grown up in Chandler and graduated from Chandler High School. And then I worked with uh, a guy named Lynn Webb. And what was so odd is I started talking to Lynn, and I found out that Lynn Webb was George Baguette's best friend in high school. And I knew George Baguette really well because he was almost like a surrogate son for my grandfather. He spent a lot of time up at the Halter Cross, and I always looked up to him almost like a big brother figure. And, and, uh, and it was just so odd that I, here I am working with this guy, and we're talking, and it's like, what? You know, and it was uh, George's best friend. Um, and then, the icing on the cake is I ended up working for uh, a boss, uh, Ken Bond, who grew up on a, a, a little farm um, not too far from us in Chandler. And he says, oh, yeah, I, I, knew, I know your mom and dad. We bought steers from them when I was in uh, 4-H. And uh, we, I named them after your mom and dad. <laughs> and uh, what, what's interesting is uh, Ken and I are really, really close friends again now. And uh, he comes up to our place up in Heber uh, quite often and stays up there and is kind of hooked up with my mom and dad again. So um, it's really funny how, how I reconnected with my Chandler roots. And um, I've told this whole history to my kids many times. Um, they probably are tired of hearing it. And I brought them to the museum and showed them things. And I, I found a, a prescription bottle from White Cross drugs in there and you know, things. And, uh, so it, you know, it's really fascinating to maintain that connection. And the worst thing is I'm not even a resident of Chandler. I am one block north. <laughs> I, am the, I am the southwest house in Mesa. Uh, I'm border on the 101 freeway, and the canal is behind me, and on the other side of the canal is Chandler, but I keep <laughs> in Mesa. So, um, as much as I would like to get that. Um, right now, I work, uh, I'm retired from probation, and I work for um, a foster care agency that licenses uh, foster homes, and I do a lot of community recruitment, and I work down here, and uh, was looking through some of the stuff, and I'm just amazed at the growth in Chandler. Uh, and the size, I mean, it's just, uh, it just mind-boggling when I see how big it is. And when my dad was a kid, they lived outside the city limits at Alma School and uh, Chandler Boulevard. So, okay, yeah? There was something mentioned about the Indian Den? Yeah. That's, where, that's where the, 
the White Cross Drug was located. It was oh. where the Indian Dan is in the Santa Margarita building. Yeah. Okay. I got you. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, anybody else have any memories they want to share or anything? Because uh, well, at one time, wasn't the White Cross Drug where the Rexall was that the Dan Dunnings ended up owning? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. underneath the Chandler Hotel. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. It was Rexall Drug. Mm -hmm. Eric, I remember your grandfather had a patent on pink eye medicine. Because either your grandfather or your great grandfather had a patent on pink eye medicine. Oh, screw screw worm. Screw worm. Screw worm. Yes. Screw worm pink eye. What's it? Kill the screw worm. Not quite yet. That's right. That's right. He sold that out of the drugstore. Um, back then, things were different. He, he did some doctoring out of the drugstore. I mean, he did a little bit of everything. I mean, it was. Uh, and, and back then, of course, they mixed most of the drugs. They, I mean, they weren't, you know, you didn't give them a pill form. You know, you had to order and test them and mix them and all that. That's what I mean. It's scary to think that he kept the license. Current, I guess you don't have to take a test or anything, because I remember seeing it on his office. Uh, but the whole across and I was kind of shocked. I, as a little kid going up there, I, I have great memories of being up there at the Halter Cross. I remember the steps going up to the top that seemed like they were made out of um, pet, petrified wood. <coughs> yeah. I just, it was a giant log with oh, copper. Oh, yeah, top it was a yeah. petrified wood table. Tables, yeah. 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 I just thought that was, I mean, to me as a little kid, that was just amazing. And I always had this, the vision that it was like the fortress against. You know, the, uh, the Apache attack. Yeah. Of course, that's what he led you to believe, too. I think so. Yeah. 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 Oh, he did the old thing where he hit the roof and told you they were throwing rocks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I used to, I'd stay up there uh, in grade school for the, for the summer, and uh, I remember how glad I was to see you guys because during the week it was really lonely. Nobody came up during the week, but everybody came up on the weekend. Because remember, there was one time there must have been 40 people. There's a fourth of July weekend. Yeah, yeah. Weekend. and all the kids are in, out on the lawn and sleeping bags. And, yeah. yeah. One of my best memories is one of his worst memories. <laughs> there was a lot of memories were like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were making up. We were making. There was somebody. I think it was Joe or Maureen had that old lined up brownie camera, the video oh. camera, and they were playing like El Toro out there, Olé. And he picked up a uh, he said, uh, yeah. Cattle school at the horns, and I was about five years old. It scared the living stuffing out of me. It looked like the Zapruder built there, you know, with the, the grassy you knoll. Out of nowhere comes this little kid with a garden trowel over the pump, boom, and around his head. <laughs> and then the film, flip, 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 flip. That was <laughs> still have the teeth marks in my head. <laughs> the other thing I remember is that your grandmother had a library to beat the band. And we, oh yeah, man, that was the best thing about going up there. Is if you were a kid and you loved to read, she had books for you like crazy. Did you ever hear her sing the French national anthem? No, I, I oh. didn't call that. She may have sung it, but I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> no, she was in the process. She was extremely uh, educated, yes. Uh, yes. well educated, and uh, when I was a little kid, she read all the children's classics to me. And I remember getting an award in grade school because of knowing all that. Wow. Um, and I didn't read them myself. She read them to me. Um, but yeah, those were really, really special times. Um, I've got some um, pictures that I'll show you that, that I put together that I got from Kathy. If I can get this for you. And let me pull a chair up there so they can get it. And you might want to turn the lights down. Okay. Is that enough? <coughs> No, that's that's no, ours. Oh, yeah. It's probably us. You're welcome to come up and stay anytime you want. It's unconditional. We've even got the letter uh, signing. There you go. Just like all of us. Give us a mask. Okay. Are you close to the highway? I mean, should we have to see? We're nine, nine miles off the highway, oh. but it, it's it's really good road. Oh. Okay, 
That's my great grandparents, uh, Edward and Mary Otis Blake. I couldn't find any of them when they were a lot younger. Most of the pictures I found of them were, were when they were older. It looks like there's a feet in the background. It might be. I'm not sure. I remember the captain's <laughs> Okay. This, this is my grandfather's car, and there's a whole bunch of pictures of that. He was really proud of it. It was, I think, a 1920 Studebaker special convertible. Wow. Uh, boy. Yeah. And it's parked in front of the aerodrome where he first worked. So you can see his glass up behind it. Right, on the other corner. There he is, looking pretty snazzy with his uh, boots. And, uh, uh, and this is taken up at Roosevelt Dam. That's my grandmother, and excuse the picture, I'm in the process of restoring it, and I didn't have time to get it finished. Yeah. Yeah. And there he is standing, again, in front of the uh, Aero Drug Store. What I think is really interesting is it's a shotgun in the window. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How long has it been since you could buy a shotgun at the drugstore? The six weeks. The one stop robbery. Yeah. I was uh, Western Hobbit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, this one, if anybody can identify any of these other people, um, wow. this is taken in uh, White Cross Drugs after he owned it. And he, my grandfather, is on the far left. And I don't know who all these other people are. <laughs> Is that, is that where Duddings was as well? Uh-huh. No. Yeah. No. Huh? No? No. Is this when it was at the well, Sandbox? Duddings is, got moved, it moved down to where Duddings used to be, but this this was in the San Marcos Hotel. Okay. Okay. okay, look at this. Indian dinner. Yeah. Oh, where the yeah. Indian dinner. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, look at the ceiling. You can tell oh, it's yeah. the ceiling that, and the window's on the left. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Got a box of chairs for 49 cents. Got a silk fountain. And the pharmacy is in the very back. The deer head. Yeah, like the deer head. Do you have a year on that, Eric? No. Yeah. 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 No, I don't have a year. Um, I'm thinking it's. When do you expect to get one? 26, 27. <laughs> right around there. Now, the back of this one says that he's going hunting. I don't know if any time he'd go hunting, he'd tie. I don't know what that gave me. Maybe it's Sunday. Yeah, that's, that's my grandmother. Church in this one. Okay, this is uh, my grandparents, and my dad is a newborn with my great grandparents. And it looks like it's taken out at the. Uh, at, well, Either that or the place that uh, Elm School is shown oh, okay. <laughs> That's the place uh, where I lived for a while as a kid and where my dad grew up. Um, again, a pretty funky place. Had a beautiful, great big formal living room, uh, you know, kind of a Spanish colonial style, and then the kitchen, which was a tacked on frame thing that was really, really hot. Uh, in the summer. Uh, in the front is the sleeping porch. Um, and what year was it you said you remember driving down to see the first swamp cooler? Oh, 1938. 1938. Wow. Uh, before that, they slept on a sleeping porch in a wet sheet. Um, and a lot of scorpions out there. Uh, my mom said I had. Uh, baby bed was in glass jars to keep the scorpions out of my baby bed. It was all screened in. Uh, that's my dad and my uncle working uh, outside the house there. That's my grandmother and Dorothy Appleby. Now that's my grandfather and my dad and uncle at the old original Black Canyon house. Now that house burned down in the uh, Rodeo Chet Sky Fire, uh, which is too, I mean, it, it wasn't very hospitable to live in, but it was still a pretty uh, neat place. Well, yeah, they were, sort of. Sort of. <laughs> I don't think it was a good idea. There's the old Chandler pool, which was at um, 
McQueen and Pecos. Fry. 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 French fry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that was our speed lot. Um, and that was taken around 1950. Um, it's looking north. You can see um, Camelback Mountain on the very left, and then to the left of that, uh, Tinty Buttes and Papago Buttes. That's my grandfather's famous uh, feed mixer, uh, which is documented in the newspaper article I brought in. Uh, I have no idea how it worked. Um, but he kind of had a, a, a self-intent cattle business where he would have the uh, cattle up north on the range and bring them down, feed them in Chandler, uh, the whole works. Because um, after he sold this place, uh, after that, he would have to sell them and feed them on other commercial feedlots. Uh, another view, um, that's uh, Elm School Road on the, on the right, or Gibson Road. Uh, that's my mom and dad and me. Uh, that's probably 53. Okay, I think that's it for that one. Now, the other ones I've got. <laughs> These are taken from the uh, January 1950 National Geographic, and this is uh, an article written by Francis Lyne on the Iberino uh, Sheep Trail. Uh, and the resolution on these is terrible. Uh, I'm going to skip that. I made a blow up of it. That's Francis Lyne, uh, who uh, did the film and then later uh, wrote the articles in the book. And that's taken on a pasture down in Chandler. That's my grandfather uh, swinging out over the Salt River at the um, Salt River uh, suspension bridge where the sheep crossed the Salt River. Blue Point? Blue Point, yeah. Now this is trailing the sheep in Chandler uh, on, on, at the very, very beginning. And the bottom is Francis Lyon's daughter. There's another picture of the suspension bridge at Blue Point. Um, another picture of the sheep. Uh, this is the camp. Um, they trekked everything on burrows, and then my grandfather would meet them at certain points along the way and bring supplies out. Um, there, uh, as Pablo Chavez, yeah, Pablo was the uh, camp cook and the farrier. And, uh, there you go. Um, Eric, when did you say that your family quit the trail? What year did the first time? 1945. Yeah, 1945. Okay. He didn't do it for that long. Um, this is up by um, Bushnell Tanks, uh, which at that time was called Reno Pass. And if anybody's ever been up there, you can definitely tell it was a sheep trail. It's totally denuded with nothing but dirt and rocks. They, and they didn't leave anything up there. Um, Tonto Creek. At the very end, I've got a map so I can show you the trail. Now this is how they counted them. They stood and made a, a, a bridge that the sheep would have to jump over and, and then they would count them. And the amazing thing on this trek, they didn't lose a single sheep on the whole trip. This is taken in the uh, camping in the Sierra Anchas. Um, okay, that's how old it is, the suspension bridge. Uh, the goat which is what they would use to lead the sheep. They used to call it Judas goat. Yeah, Judas goat. Judas goat. Because the yeah. sheep would all follow him. Oh. Okay, this is the, a map of the, of the trip that they would take. Uh, did, did, they, did they have any um, sheep ranchers like in Mesa that did the same trip? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, George Wilbur. Okay. They basically crossed the Salt River, uh, followed um, 
Sycamore Creek up through um, what's now Sunflower, and from there they went up uh, to the uh, um, Reno Pass, which is in the Montezal Mountains, now it's the Bushnell Tanks. Then they went down across Clonmel Creek, then they went up over the Sierra Anchas and down into Pleasant Valley, then they climbed the Mogollon Rim, and they went right by um, our place at Black Canyon, uh, went through there, because I remember as a kid still seeing them come through there. And then uh, they went all the way uh, past uh, Heber, um, out towards uh, Dry Lake, which is going towards Holbrook, and cut around the backside of Snowflake and came in uh, that way. Uh, so they kind of bypassed Snowflake um, and uh, Sholo, and uh, they ended up on the, uh, basically the side of Mount Baldy, the White Mountains, is where they uh, passed through the sheep. Then in the fall, they turned around, did the whole thing back, drove them all back. Um, Okay, uh, I think that's it. Okay. Why did that tradition start to do that? No, most of the sheep, but wasn't it expensive to move all those sheep and stay that long and do that? Well, it was way too hot. It couldn't pasture down here in the summertime. Uh, and originally when it started, it, I mean, it was really difficult to truck sheep back then. I, I mean, they, they're much more sophisticated now. And, and all the, the sheep ranchers that are left, um, they, they truck their sheep. The Dobsons kept doing it for a long time just to keep the tradition alive. But uh, not, not because it, it paid to do it. Um, and then there was another sheep trail on the west side of the valley that from the Tolleson area, that was mostly Basque families, they would drive their sheep all the way up to Flagstaff for their, for their uh, summer range and do the same thing back and forth. But this one was famous because it was a much longer uh, trail and uh, it was the longest sheep trail in the U.S. The, uh, kind of to add a little bit of that, they, they were trekking them because it was a, not only a trail, but also they were feeding on their way up there and on their way back. So they had that to do, and then when they were up in the range up there, they were feeding in the summertime, but it wasn't hot, you know, and vice versa. And uh, uh, Candy Dobson Pedersen back here is Dwayne Dobson's daughter. They've been, they they trekked the sheep this last uh, last spring up there, and then uh, they're selling the sheep, and so that, that'll be the end of the, uh, the sheep trail. They're the last ones yeah. to be trailing the sheep. So they had about 4,000 head that they were, they were trailing uh, up until now. But uh, anyway, that, that's kind of a lot of history and tradition. And for two of them, I really didn't realize that your family had done that. And I, yet I, I knew the uh, uh, E.B. Uh, or yeah, Freeman, you know, whatever, and Mary, <coughs> And the uh, granddaughter is here. And uh, so there's, there's a lot of other connections. And interesting, I was telling them that, uh, you know, I play golf once in a while with Milt Coggins. Not that the son of the son, yeah. that you're talking about. And, and Milt is about 75 now. The guy that I, that I uh, play golf with. Senior Milt Coggins ended up living just half a mile north of us in yeah. Phoenix. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure. But anyway, that's, that's amazing. You, a lot of connections there. That, I really appreciate that. Jim, would you? I just thought you want to introduce uh, your mom and dad, yeah. Eric. Okay. Apparently. Yeah. Uh, this is my mom and dad, uh, Hugh and Joyce Gibson. Mm -hmm. uh, 